So performance tips for Rails stack, a very cliche title here. So I actually want to clarify, I mean, when I first came up with this title, I was like, okay, let me come up with the, the stuff we've done at Grab. And then once I realized like, these might not really apply to everyone. So I want to rephrase and be like, performance tips we use at Grab for a Rails stack, right? So um, hi, I'm Altaf Hamis. Uh, I'm a lead engineer here at Grab. My colleague told me to put a picture of myself. I couldn't find a good flattering one of me, so I put a cat. Uh, and Yang Shun convinced me to give a presentation here. You see, yeah. So you know, when we when we think about Rails, the first thing that we hear is always like, you know, does Rails scale? Does Rails scale? And so then, you know, I went to Google, as we always do, and then we you know we do. Can Rails scale? <laughs> yeah, very disappointing um, for me, right? And then here at Grab, we use we use Rails extensively, and so that wasn't very encouraging so we decided no we want we want to make it scale and so i just want to preface with what this talk is not about right it's not your usual scale talk that says you know don't do n plus one queries use pluck instead of instantiating ar models uh cache frequently use data in redis or memcache you know uh, the usual stuff that you see in pretty much any article that tells you how do you scale rails those are things that you should be doing you know no one should be telling you don't do those things like, those are beginner beginner traps right the main thing that everyone should know is that most of the time, it's not Rails. It's how you designed your app. And that is something very hard for people to grasp. So, so what are our numbers here at Grab, right? This is what people are interested in. So our Rails stack does around 360,000 requests per minute uh, on, on peak, usually at peak. That's around 6,000 requests per second. And we just run that on 10 instances. We run it on, we could run it on we run it on pretty big machines, C4, 4x large on AWS, if uh, for those matter. And our average response time is about 33 milliseconds, but our 99 percentile is around 128. The 99 is a pretty skewed by a few APIs, unfortunately, which we haven't fixed yet. But those are pretty decent numbers for any scale, right? 6,000 requests per second is nothing to be scoffed at. And we're just running it on 10 machines, and mo and we are in no way throttled by machines. We could just put on more, more, more machines and handle at least double the load easily. So the first thing that we do heavily here at Grab is something like this. So we, we use Redis uh, to feature flag, right? So feature toggles or site was, whatever you like to call it. So we do something like this. So we instantiate a Redis, um, and then we just do like, if configuration Redis dot get some feature and it's enable that new feature of some flag is true, we do a new feature else something else. Uh, we do this heavily because you know, we, need to, we can't rely on deployments all the time. Deployments take at least like 10 minutes for us to roll out. Um, so we need to be able to quickly turn on a feature. If things are not working, we quickly turn it off. And so when these are on heavy endpoints, you get a, a lot of hits to Redis, right? And Redis is pretty good. But you, know, you, you, you start you know, encountering the fact that you're hitting it a lot with a lot of gets, which are pretty meaningless, because these flags barely ever change, right? You probably set them once. You probably flip, the, flip them off at one point, And you never, probably never uh, flip them off until you remove them from code, right? So how do you cache something that's already in memory, right? Well, I mean, something that's already in a memory store. So actually support cache memory store. So this is local memory, right? And this is exactly an extract from uh, the Rails guides. It's not appropriate for large application deployments, but can work for well small, low traffic sites. Yeah, we chose to ignore that. Um, so this is something that uh, one of my colleagues did. Uh, he think he's here. Oh, I'm not, not sure. Yeah, Zochun. So we, what we actually did is we decided to basically delegate everything uh, through here. And what happens is once we get it from Redis, we actually store it in memory on that instance. right? Because most of these, times, most of these values don't change, once they get fetched, we keep them for about 30 seconds. 30 seconds is pretty low TTL. And I'll explain why it's 30 seconds and why we didn't go higher. Um, so what happens is you hit Redis once. You, st you store it in memory for 30 seconds on a single instance. So at most, for you need to hit 10 times, right, uh, for, for all 10 instances to get, the, to get a local memory store. And that actually works surprisingly well. Because if you look uh, at our AWS graph, because we use Elastic Cache, that's right after we deployed. Uh, because we use gets and edge gets, that's the significant drop that we got. We got around 20K 
yeah, 20k drop um, per minute, right? Which is pretty impressive. We can actually get more. The fact here is the why it's so low in a drop is because we use a 30 second TTL. We could actually do an hour TTL. Why don't we? Is that when we want to turn off a feature fast, we can't wait for one hour for it to turn off. So we need a way to invalidate it in memory quickly across all instances. We just have to write a script that basically purges memory on each instance. We haven't done that. If we can do that, if we have a way to like say, look, we want to switch this flag and purge all the uh, local memory stores, you could cache it for how long as you want. So as long as you, the moment you, fix the, you flip the flag, um, you, ca you, you bust all the caches, then you can actually increase this TTL to way more and get much more significant savings when you hit Redis. Um, so, so this was pretty cool. And everyone's like, OK, that's pretty awesome. But Redis is already very performant. You, know, you don't get much gain from this. The big point is like always the DB, right? Can we do this with the DB? And so surprisingly, yesterday, we found out yeah, we could do it with the DB. And so this is something that we actually deployed yesterday to production. Um, so this is basically two models we have on Active Record, which is country details and cities. And these are very static data on, our mod, uh, on Active Record, right? They have very basic uh, configuration information that could exist in config files, but they exist on Active Record, right? And so that when we expand and stuff, we can just act, we have you know, interface pages to add them up. Most of this, ma the majority of this data barely ever changes. So we decided to uh, cache this in memory as well. Uh, with a much longer cache, if I believe. And then these are most significant drops on queries. Sorry. Um, so this would be like 25K and 30K, dropping to around 10K. That's around 40,000 queries per minute off the DB by just caching it in memory. This is something I have not seen being done a lot in Rails apps, right? You don't see memory, like local memory caching being promoted anywhere in like Rails performance guides. And I think that's something we should be exploring more, because there's definite use cases. You need to be aware of all the, all the edge cases, with obviously storing in local memory, and the fact that it's local memory, and it's not a shared, mem shared cache. But I think there are much bigger opportunities here. And we've just start, barely started touching the surface on what we can do here with local memory, because it's way faster. It reduces all your hits on your data store, and it's, it's way easier to manage, right? The problems, however, come with debugging, right? There is no easy way to debug this. So don't cache data that you feel as you know, you'd want to be able to debug, because it's really messy, because you don't know when it's coming from local memory and when it's coming from uh, either Redis or your DB. So that's something to keep in mind when uh, doing it. But we found out that it's pretty useful to cache these kind of data that you, you, you pull frequently, but that rarely ever changes. So the next thing that we did was sort of partitioning our data, right? Um, Rails apps are very much tailored to use a single DB. And this single DB quickly becomes the bottleneck, right? as everyone would have experienced. And so usually when we say partition our data, we partition the DB, um, we, we might do some sharding. Uh, and so on, but what we but we are um, so we are on RDS. Uh, we use AWS RDS, and you can, you could part, we do partitioning uh, of certain tables, but RDS doesn't have really good uh, off the box uh, sharding abilities, right? So we decided to use something called a gem called Octopus. So Octopus um, is a gem that is mainly used for read replicas uh, to read uh, off read replicas which we don't use, but it also has an ability. So if you read this section, uh, which is called mixing octopus with the Rails multiple database model, you'll find out that you can actually, oh, where you, go away? Um, you can actually connect to multiple databases. So this is super useful when you start segregating your data. So you decide, let's say, for example, uh, in the case of Grab, let's say you want you know, a certain system of, of yours in your Rails app is quite um, how would you say, encapsulated. It doesn't require a lot of other data. As long as it has its subset of data, you put that in a separate DB. right? The core data, you put in a main DB. Um, you, uh, the data that you, know, you might use frequently, you put in a separate DB. The one that has high reads, you put in a separate DB. So you can, you can also uh, then 
or you can optimize your DB for the kind of workflow that you need. You need high write, you need a high write throughput, you can do that. So we have a database which is mostly analytical info coming in from the apps and so on. And so it's just right. So no one reads from that DB ever in production. It just basically goes straight to our analytics pipeline, right? So th it doesn't need to be optimized for reads. MySQL, by default, would be you know, sort of a, on, a, on a balanced approach. When you put that DB on high writes, just partitioning, you can just forget about it, right? It definitely does have some gotchas, though, right? You can't do join so easily. So that's why you need to have your database data quite segregated, or you need to do multiple queries to get the data where you need, right? You need to be careful of transactions and rollbacks, especially when they do multiple or across multiple databases. So because if you start a transaction on one database and then you start doing a query on the second one, you might end up rolling back only one of them and not rolling back the other. Uh, this link here, uh, I won't go through all of them because this link actually summarizes most of it uh, about what, they, what things to watch out for when you use the Rails database, multiple database model. Um, but how does it work for us, right? So we were on RDS um, 8x large, which is the largest RDS instance available. Um, we, and on average, we used to do like 30% CPU, right? So, so these are four databases, all different sizes, right? Uh, names have been hidden, unfortunately, because it's recorded. <laughs> so um, our main database, which is like you can see the most number of connections, is like 10% 10, 10 right? That's actually where the bulk of the data is. The second database is actually what I said about the analytics. So it's where all the writes go through, and it's around 12%. The third database is interestingly used for a very cron-specific uh, um, kind of uh, system. So it basically runs mostly at uh, midnight, past midnight. So you'd see the database spike up then to around 30%, 35%, and usually it's uh, like doing nothing during the day. Uh, and the fourth DB, which is something we introduced newly, uh, which is why you don't see much CPU there, um, is something that we start, we starting to do for some filtering, right? So it's not yet ag aggressively used, so that's why it's so low and so little connections. And we found out it works pretty well. As long as you can encapsulate your data decently enough, Rails actually provides all the tools to um, work well with multiple databases. And, and, and we actually patched up, uh, so we patched up the migration uh, to actually work well with um, the, current, the way you do normal migration. So you can, we could actually do something like Rails G migration database name, and it would actually generate the migration for it. You could do Rails G, I mean, you could do Reg DB migrate, and that database and it will migrate that database and so on. So you know you could keep your exact same workflow, uh, same deployment pipeline. I mean, just add these commands and you pretty much uh, it works out of the box. There are some um, problems with, as I mentioned about the joins, but most of them are workaroundable, right? But this applies to Redis as well, right? Um, so we actually use multiple Redises, which is common. Uh, but we split it up again, same for workflow reasons, right? So our Rails cache is on a completely separate Redis. Uh, the configuration Redis, which I showed you, is on a completely separate Redis. Sidekick runs on a separate Redis. We have a general Redis that um, is used for whatever uh, general low-level caching that we do, or maybe you know when we use some of the data types that Redis provides. And then we have a shared Redis where we sh we share some data, or when we want to invalidate caches across stacks, right? So because across another service. So we have some services written in Go. So when we want to invalidate their caches maybe, we would, we would push something through Redis and they would then read the latest data of Redis. Right. So we decided about talking about Redis, we talked about the DB, now we need to go deeper, right? Partition rails. Right? Um, so if you if you talk about um, our Rails app at the moment, when it started off, it, I mean, as a general monolith here at Grab, it used to do a lot of things, right? But if you if you distill it, it is two things in one. It was basically a front end uh, for our sort of a management page, which all our ops teams uses, like you know, to see the current status, to update, you know, to see bookings, details, and you know, the same, you know, the usual CRUD flow and and all other things, right? But it was also a backend service that was processing bookings, you know, uh, was the passenger AP, the API for our passenger app. And so it was two very much different workflows, as, as you could imagine, because one is basically a backend API JSON server, uh, and a second one is basically a full stack Rails app. 
And, and they we find out that they have very different performance requirements, right? So we actually use Rails engines here. And so we actually split it up. So we defined a core, core, mod, core which basically had the shared models and methods across two separate Rails apps, right? Web, so we called one Web API, which is basically the API for the front-end management system. And one we call Control Center, which is basically all the internal backend systems, and including the API for the passenger. Why would we do this? Um, so one thing we found out was Control Center handles the bulk of the throughput, right? And because obviously, because it's coming from the app, while the web API is coming from users accessing the page, which is our stuff, right? Which is much significantly much less. So we could actually provision a few machines for web API, very smaller machines. I think it's C4 large, and we provision C4 X large, 4 X large, for Control Center, right? The second thing that was more useful is that, for example, when we have to communicate with external APIs, for example, bookings is now on a, we have a Go service that handles bookings. So we have to query that API to get some details. Now the APIs that Control Center calls are related to the PAX app. So then you want very fast response times, right? A PAX app is not going to wait one second, two seconds for a response. You know, you, you'd order it on the order of milliseconds. So we want to set timeouts like very low timeouts, like three seconds, forget it. I'm, I don't care whether I get the response or not. I'd rather time out on the client side, right? But for the for the management portal, you're probably doing a bit more heavier queries. You're probably doing searches, some filters. So you don't mind waiting as a bit, lo a bit longer for the query to come through. So by splitting it, you could actually set different timeouts for your, on your application or YML or you know, however you load your configs um, that actually treat them two dif two differently. But because they share the same models, you don't have to re replicate two different code bases. right? So that proved very advantageous. The second thing is different gems. So we don't want that math end problem, right? So if, if Control Center wants to use math end, that's fine. We're not including it in Web API, right? So that's something. So you don't, you don't want to get surprised by gems. So the core gems are things that are very core, so New Relic, RPM, and you know, Redis, and so on. Uh, very few Puma, our web server. But we don't include any gem otherwise. So we include it first in the specific app that wants it. And if you want to migrate it to core, it has to be really reasoned why. The third thing is optimizing Puma. So Puma, I mean, if you've used Puma before, you know, it has, it's a process and multi-process and multi-thread. So on Control Center, we run, because um, it's very fast response, and you know, it does, each request lasts for a very short time, we spin up a lot of threads and a lot of workers. right? We can't do that with Web API, because some requests take longer. They are more memory intensive. And so what, hap what used to happen to us before was that we used to have, we used to have memory, memory constraints. Because someone would do an export, and then suddenly, like you know, that instance is like running out of memory because we have so many threads as well because it's handling all the requests. By splitting that up, we could have fewer threads on Web API and more threads on Control Center because these ones process faster and are done quicker, while the Web API ones can be slow and people are willing to wait for a thread to to be ready to serve them. Finally, the the Web API doesn't require background workers, so we had. Why do we need Psychic running on those instances? Just throw them out. However, your PAX app on replicas, your PAX app wants real-time data. It doesn't want outdated data. If you're having replica lag, you know that's probably something going to go wrong when we start returning data from our, when our replica is lagging. But on our management platform, it's a bit fine. I mean, we can stand with replica lag. It's pretty obvious when replica is lagging. And it's not a deal breaker. They can wait for their data to get, come maybe a few minutes late. They don't have to process it then and there. So we could reduce load on our main DB by actually using replicas for our management platform. Um, so in basically, in short, it's basically optimizing each cranny for, for each app. right? And by doing that, you could actually reduce the overall load on your system by, by separating the different workflows that you have for your app. But again, you, know, you have problems, right? So Let's say, for example, there's something that happens to your booking. And for, let's say, for example, your management system can also cancel a booking. And so let's say you know, the passenger tries to do something, and you try to do something in your management system. You need to make sure that uh, there's some locking in place. right? So we use optimistic locking. It works well across Rails app because it checks the lock version, and then it raises stale object errors. But you need to be able to add the error handling to handle those stale object er errors if they occur. So that's one thing that you need to be careful of. 
Debugging. So debugging issues now span across both apps. We've got two sets of logs to scan. It's not in order. Um, so those kind of issues come up as well. Um, there's also operational overhead, right? If there's something changing on core, right? And if, let's say, Control Center deploys, then they are running a different version of core than the one that's running on Web API. And we haven't had much, too much issues with it. Uh, but if there is something that you know, changes a fundamental behavior, we need to be really careful with how we deploy the change to production. So we might have to actually then you know, do this whole feature flag, deploy both versions. They, they, they both read the same flag, then flip the flag over. So then they both start reading at the same time, and they, they flip the behavior at the same time. Um, so in managing stable releases, this can be a bit tricky because you don't because the, it's still one repo, uh, one this thing we don't we don't do sub modules, so it's a bit uh, tricky to create stable releases. Uh, but other than that, we haven't had much issues, and that for for me generally, uh, the advantages generally outweigh the the problems with it. So these are some of the things that we use at Grab to to scale. We've done a lot more. Uh, unfortunately, don't have much time to talk about it. I could go. I don't have much code to share here as well because it's pretty lengthy, and I don't think anyone's interested in it. So you could contact me if you want to see some uh, things on how we did stuff, or you could just let me know. Um, so yeah, thank you. Any questions? So you're saying you had engines. Is your core engine in a gem, like separate to the main repo? Uh, yeah, uh, so it's also part of the main repo. It's still in the repo, uh, but it's pretty much we. It's written like a gem, but we require the Rails engine directly in the code base. So is the Web API and the admin section and the core all in the same repo? Yes, yes. we could have packaged it as a gem. So that would actually solve that versioning problem. But we didn't. We don't make um, so we don't make much changes to core as often. So and most of the changes aren't. Breaking. So we first, if so, if you're introducing a new model, we would first introduce it to core, then deploy it. So then there's a core already out there. Then we'd put the the specific uh, code for the specific app. That'll call it, yeah. yeah, that'll call. It. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. If you put the engine in the repo, yeah. and then uh, when using engine, that means you have multiple uh, multiple uh, real app which is using the same engine. No, no. So we don't use we don't run multiple apps on the same instance. Okay. Uh, we run only one of those one of those apps. I mean the real Yes. Like, so you, like, the real engine is only for one particular app for your case or so the engine is actually core, right? And both of the apps rely on that one engine. So there's only one engine. I see. So engine is one repo and then the two real apps. No, no, they're all in one repo. Oh, oh, it's not. Yeah, so it's all in one repo, so they all spin up. It's one Rails, one, one Rails instance that spins up. Sorry. Uh, so you start to store a lot of things in memory. Does GC affect you in any way? Not really. Um, so we don't, I mean, we don't store 100,000 records. Uh, um, I think uh, if you, so for the active record model, the active record models, I think they are about 200, 200 records that we're storing in memory. Um, which doesn't seem to be affecting GC at all, according to our stats. Yeah. Um, I haven't still, because we did this only on Monday, we haven't still got s size comparisons to see how much, uh, si how much of our memory store is being used. Because I know it starts off with like 38 MB default or something. You need, to, you need to expand. If it runs out, it'll actually start throwing things out of memory. So because uh, memory store already specifies a maximum it stores, and if it starts going to exceed that, it'll actually just start um, throwing out things which are not uh, last in use. Yeah. Yeah. Regarding the partition, right? How do you do the version? Sorry. Uh, regarding the partition, yes. How do you do the version? Versioning for the DB or for the app? So for the app, um, so um, when we deploy, we create tags on GitHub. Um, how we do it is we basically uh, each team creates their own tag if they want to. So because it doesn't matter whether a change on core uh, goes both ways, right? So what we what we make sure is that as long as your change in core doesn't affect us, then we are fine. So we basically try not to. We always keep core as something that's backwards compatible, right? We don't introduce breaking changes on core. If you want to introduce a 
a method that's going to change existing behavior, you'd introduce it as a new method. Then you'd ask the two uh, apps to change to that method. So they can do it independently of just changing code. So that's how we sort of keep versioning in track. So it requires a bit of a manual review there, uh, which is where that kind of that step comes in. But otherwise, we create releases independent of each other. Sorry. Yeah. Such a heavy usage. Have you ever had any issues with uh, memory leaks? Yes. Uh, quite a lot, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we had a memory leak, but most of them have been through gems. Uh, we've never had a memory leak that was caused by us. Uh, we've had things like where we instantiate too, mu too much memory uh, because we load too much active record models. Uh, so we need to switch to SQL instead, right? Uh, but so we had a, a gem that used to do push notifications. I do not remember the gem name right now. It was an Apple push notification gem. Um, I think it was Pusher. I, f I can't remember, though. Um, and so it would actually uh, start leaking memory, and then it would cause Psychic to seg, seg fault. Um, and we actually, did, we actually didn't f couldn't figure out, other than do a git bisect and figure out, like, hey, you know, it started somewhere around this release, so it's probably this, and then we just switched out the gem, and then, yeah, that, that's one. Uh, the second memory leak we had was when we tried to use gRPC uh, in Rails. Unfortunately, the gRPC Ruby gem is absolutely horrible. Don't ever use it. Um, we tried to patch it ourselves. We, we submitted pull requests, uh, but it's very slow, and it's, it has a ton of memory leaks. Sidekick also has some memory leaks, which is unfortunate. Um, the recent one that they patched uh, up um, in the latest version for Psychic. Our web API app has a small memory leak, um, which is so small that we've chosen to ignore it at the moment because it doesn't um, affect us. But we need to figure out. But we haven't still figured out where's the leak from. Yeah, but definitely. Uh, but majority of the time, it's been from gems. Okay. Uh, if anyone has more questions, can yeah, uh, please. Good for after that. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Yang. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Altir first. <laughs>